All right, so <laughs> thanks. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I think I probably know a whole bunch of faces down there. It's great that you have so many new people showing up. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that I did in 2019. Luckily, it was scheduled for 2019. Um, which was uh, caving in Greenland. So it's the second time I've gone caving in Greenland. The first time was in um, some um, glacier caves. Um, so that that we had a that was a film crew. We didn't get to do proper caving. This was proper caving. It's much more interesting. Um, so we're going to talk about what we did in Greenland with the the Greenland caves projects. So I'm just going to turn this into a, a laser pointer. Okay. Um, for these, those that don't know where Greenland is, it's this island here. So it's the biggest island in the world if you consider Australia a continent. Um, for its location, this is Canada, this is Iceland, um, the UK right here. So very big island. It actually um, is covered by one of the largest ice sheets in the world, the second only to Antarctica. Um, and it's kind of interesting because this ice sheet's pretty thick it's over 7,000 feet thick and it's so heavy it actually kind of squashes the land mass underneath it under um, the uh, current um, surface uh, sea level so if you were to take the ice away it would look like a big donut but um, that's just because of the weight of the ice eventually the the land would would pop back up which is basically what we had happen in the UK um, but it contains a lot of fresh water if um, green wood to melt then the seas would raise oh, right now about 16 feet and obviously that would inundate a lot of cities so it's really important to understand the impact of global um, climate change on what is going on in Greenland because that could be very important in our understanding of, of what will happen as as the world gets warmer um, the reason that we're so concerned about the ice sheet is because we've had steadily increasing warmer summers. The ice sheet, sheet has been melting at a much faster rate. This is a map of Greenland that was taken um, while we were there. So normally the ice sheet would be white, but wherever you have more than one millimeter of water standing on the surface of the ice, it's colored red. So um, the percentage of um, water on the surface exceeded 50%. And this is the kind of average amount of melting. It's more like 30% on average. So you can see we're, we're really starting to accelerate the melting of the, this glacier, the ice cap. And as it melts, it starts to accelerate the melting process. And we're already seeing that with larger uh, icebergs coming off of the, the ice and, and into the ocean. So definitely a big problem because there'll be a tipping point. And when that when that goes, then then all that fresh water will end up in the oceans. To understand the climate going forward, it's really important to understand the climate going backwards. And normally how you would do this if you have a glacier is that you would um, kind of drill a hole or a core down through the ice and actually look at the striations in the ice. So what happens in the summer is the water melts and it freezes and you get kind of like a, a band of ice. But then in the winter, when you have snow, um, the snow gets compacted down. So you get a fluffy white layer. And just like rings on a tree, you can take a core through ice and count backwards year by year by year to see how far you can go, how deep you can go. And the air in the, the fluffy white bit, you get these bubbles trapped in there. And you can go in with a, a needle and actually pull air out from those bubbles and do um, isotopic uh, analyses on it to figure out how warm the climate was when that air got trapped in there. So that's, you can get a record of climate in this area using those ice cores. Uh, the trouble is that the ice is only about 7,000, uh, seven, yeah, 7,000 feet thick there. So, as you go back seven thousand, as you go back seven thousand feet, you know you count up your years. Your most you can go back is one hundred and forty thousand years. So when you think about climates of um, cooling and warming, um, the interglacial periods in Greenland, we don't have a comprehensive history. We can only go back one hundred and forty thousand years based on the age of that ice. So these are just some maps that were done with to comparing data 
from different uh, isotopic studies um, in areas to look at, you know, how the climate changed over time and you got the last interglacial period. So if we want to go back more than 140,000 years, we have to use different methods. And you've probably heard of people doing um, isotopic measurements in caves using stalagmites. So the same kind of process is that you get water dripping and precipitating out the calcium carbonate, where you can actually take that, that CO2 from the calcium carbonate and look at its isotopic signature and figure out how um, warm the climate was when that CO2 was there, but also you can see how thick that band was and you can determine whether you had more drip water or less drip water. So you can kind of correlate moisture and the amount of water um, coming down the atmosphere with temperature. So if we can find um, some caves with stalagmites in Greenland, then we can get an older record and we can have a better understanding of how the climate has changed in Greenland and, and how this could mean it could change going forward. The trouble with Greenland is it's mostly covered in ice um, and the ice caves are constrained because they're only you can only go back 140,000 years with the ice. Um, and then you just have this band of rock around the outside. But there is some limestone where you see this brown here. This is known exposed limestone around the, the edge of the island. And in 1960, there was an article published in the NSS Bulletin, which was the old uh, Cave and Car Journal of Cave and Car Studies, where a couple of engineers were in northern Greenland up in the Grotsdalen Valley, which is up in here. Um, and the reason they were there was the US Air Force was putting in Air Force uh, uh, runways because they wanted to have nuclear weapons in northern Greenland. Because if you had a nuclear weapon stationed here, you could go straight over the pole and into Russia. So they put a whole bunch of runways um, uh, along this eastern coast of Greenland to, uh, <clears throat> you know, basically give them access with bombs to Russia, as you would. Uh, but they were cavers. And while they were there, they wandered off and wandered into the Grotsdalen Valley. And when they were there, they actually identified 16 caves and wrote about them in this bulletin. So uh, this is just a close-up of that area. This is a glacier, this um, kind of glacier that flows into the ocean here. Um, this is actually one of the, 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 the biggest, I can't remember what it is, but basically outflows of ice in the world. The only place in the world where anything's bigger than that flowing into the ocean is in Antarctica. But this is where that area is in, in close to detail. And you see we're above 80 degrees north um, the landing strip is in on the edge of this lake. The le lake is called Centrum So. So there's a, a landing strip here. Um, and then the Grotsdalen Valley is this area here. This is where we were working, but these are other areas where we, we found caves. And you notice there's no ice cover here. And that's because this is a polar desert. The climate is such that the snow kind of goes to the south and goes to the north. And this area doesn't get any precipitation from snow. I think the entire year, it gets about 20 centimeters of snow. So because of that, it's a polar desert and there's no snow cover. So you can walk around and go look for caves. So Gina Mosley is a climate scientist and caver at the University of Innsbruck. And she read this NSS news article and was like, well, there's, there's, caves in Greenland and she's an isotope geochemist, maybe I'll go up there and see if there's any uh, stalagmites. So no one had been up there since 1960. It's incredibly difficult to get to. You're more than a thousand miles north of the closest um, inhabited place. So she got a, a grant from National Geographic and they were able to hire a plane to drop her and four other people off with a boat and camping gear at Centrum So, they inflated their boat and they drove the boat across Centrum So and set up a base camp and then had to hike 43 miles into Grotsdalen Valley to go look for these caves. And you'll see a lot of guns in the images here. That's because this is a uh, polar bear territory. And so you can have black bears, brown bears, grizzly bears, and then polar bears. Black bears and brown bears are they, they can, they're not really predators, they're more scavengers. 
where polar bears don't scavenge, they only hunt. So if you encountered a black bear or a brown bear, you might be able to frighten it off and it's not really that fussed. But if a polar bear sees you, you are prey and it's gonna attack. So the entire time you were there, you're not allowed to do anything without carrying a gun on you, um, even going to the bathroom, even walking between buildings, um, you have to carry a gun with you in case there's a polar bear. So anyway, they hiked 43 miles to the Grotstalen Valley where these um, uh, engineers in the 1960s saw the caves and they relocated the caves. You can see there's an entrance here. This is a U-shaped cave. The other entrance pops out here. This is just an alcove, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, these are alcoves, that's a cave, and this is a really nice big cave around here. Very challenging to get to, you have to kind of hike up this free slope to get to them. So they went up there and they found um, some uh, really nice caves. This is Crystal Palace because of all the ice crystals that are found inside it. And this is inside the entrance looking outside and you can see the Grotz Dalen Valley below and it's obviously free of, of snow. There's no vegetation there. Uh, it's less than 2% coverage because there's no moisture, no water to, for the plants to use to grow. The soil is very poor. And because of that, there's, there's very few animals that are there, um, which is why polar bears will eat you if they see you. I think we saw a bird, um, a mummified rabbit, and two musk ox the entire time you we were there, which was a month. Anyway, Gina found um, flowstone. So she, uh, this cave had areas of flowstone where she was able to collect it. And she was able to use that to generate a climate record between 400 and 550,000 years ago. So it ended up being a really valuable look into climate in Greenland over that 150,000 year time span. And she was able to use that research data to get additional funding. So in 20, I believe it was 2017, she got a SMART award from the Austrian Science Foundation, which was enough to pay for a full-size return, expedition return to the Grotz Island Valley to, to go look and see if we could cut, find other caves that had a, a broader range of flowstone in it. So we could actually expand that climate record. And she was able to put a bigger team together. So rather than just Gina and um, people helping her, uh, she actually brought some glaciologists, geologists, and, and microbiologists. So this is Gina with her PhD student, Paul. Uh, this is um, Paul Smith from the University of Oxford. He did the original geology of this area. Um, this is Andrew. Um, who is a professor of uh, glaciology at the University of Sheffield and his graduate student, Adam. Um, and then I was brought along as a geomicrobiologist. Robbie Schoen was the expedition photographer. If you don't know Robbie, he's a Nat Geo photographer um, and uh, Gina's husband. And then Chris Blakely, he's the international trainer for Petzl, which was kind of cool because we got to work with some Petzl swag. And there were these two guys that were with us as well. And they ended up being the pilot for the helicopter and his mechanics. So there was one helicopter on the eastern side of Greenland. So for that, you know, 2000 mile long stretch, there was one helicopter and we rented it for three weeks. Um, and we even put a sticker on the front of it. Uh, so we had our own pilot um, who was Stig Eric. And because we're thousands of miles from any way of repairing the helicopter, um, he was up there with his uh, mechanic, Hans Christian, who could basically, if it broke down, fix it, because there was no way of getting to us if something happened to that helicopter. So that was the team. Mm -hmm. To get everything there, there is no, um, there, you can't just kind of put everything in a plane and take it with you because we're so remote. We have to charter planes and helicopters to get where we're going. What happened was Gina bought all of the supplies that we needed um, over a year in advance and packaged it all, put it in a shipping container and put it on a boat. And it went by boat to Northern Greenland where it was dropped off at a weather station so that we could actually pick it up a, a year later. So this is the level of organization is everything has to get shipped there 
year in advance. And we were all allowed to bring about 35 pounds of personal gear. Everything else had to be shipped in advance. And it had to be 35 pounds of personal gear because when you added up the weight of all the people and our stuff, the plane could only carry a thousand kilos. So we had to be under those limits. So this is how we, we got there. So this is Greenland and this is Iceland. So the first thing we did was all fly into Reykjavik and spent a day in Reykjavik getting together. Uh, then we flew from Reykjavik to Akiari, which is a small town. It's a small fishing village. So it is a small fishing town on the north side of Iceland. And then from there, we flew to Constable Point, which is this point right here on Greenland. Uh, we had to uh, um, charter a plane, so we chartered a plane for a week on the front end and a week on the back end of the expedition because we didn't know if they, we'd have a good weather window. So the plane had to just basically be hanging about ready to take us up there. So this is the plane in Akureyri. Then we flew from Akureyri to Greenland across the um, uh, North Atlantic. You see it's starting to get ice. This was in July and then flew into Constable Point. And you can see the runway at Constable Point. This is the only runway on the eastern side of Greenland. Um, this was one of the run one ways that was built by the US military. Um, and then it was sold to Denmark for a dollar. And they have a little bit of infrastructure there. It's mostly for tourists. Um, tourists will stay in a hotel there and, and trek around, but it's a really, really basic hotel. It, doesn't have any enough infrastructure to support like bathrooms so the bathroom is literally it's not quite a bucket it's a it's more like a um a groover but you basically it all goes in a bag and and that's their hotel as you stay at their hotel everything is bottled water where you land there um fuel up again um take off and then fly north from constable point to damoxhaven and damoxhaven is the northernmost habited or at least settlement, um, there could be some Inuit living further north, but the known northernmost habited area of Greenland, um, flying there, more ice, um, amazing valleys obviously not being touched. And then we arrive at Damakshavn, and this is a pretty famous place for polar exploration. This is where a lot of the expeditions that headed up to find the North Pole came from, a lot of the expeditions that tried to find the Northwest Passage as you stopped at Damoxhaven. And you can see that they have shipping containers there. So this is a weather station for the Danish government. It's the, I believe the northerly most weather station in the world. And uh, they get uh, shipping containers dropped off once every two years. So everything they need for two years, apart from fresh food, which uh, fresh vegetables and fruit that comes in by plane every now and again, um, comes in these shipping containers. So we landed there, it's not a commercial airport or anything. Um, it's just some guys managing this weather station. So they picked up all our gear in their, in their digger and took it to where we stayed. And then the next day we started prepping all the gear for the expedition. So you can see that this is the shipping container with all the boxes. These are, everybody had their own box of food where we were rationed for six weeks because we had to be prepared to be stuck on the ice because of, or not on the ice, there was no ice there, um, stuck um, in the northern area for uh, two weeks because of bad weather. So we had to be prepared for that. So they're starting to put stuff together. And then you see in the back, there's these cans of fuel. And that was the fuel for the helicopter. So what happened is we landed, we stowed overnight, and then they started filling up the plane with these um, drums of fuel. The plane would take as many as it could carry weight-wise, fly up to the uh, to Centrum So, dump them, fly back. It would fuel up, so it's fueling up from some of the uh, drums that Gina took up there or had shipped up there. Then it would fly another bunch up so that we had enough fuel for the helicopter because the helicopter had to fly for Damark's Haven up to Centrum So, but it needed enough fuel to fly back. It was a two and a half hour trip for the helicopter. Um, we did see polar bears. This was right outside of the kitchen in Damakshaven. Um, and yeah, this was my first experience. They have a gun hanging by the door. They have a series of guns hanging by the door. And if you go outside to do anything, even if it's to walk to the 
um, the bedroom uh, cabin, which is 10 feet away, you have to take a gun. And they're like, don't just take the gun, look left and right like you're crossing the road when you go out there. So that was Danmark's Haven. So the day after that, when all the fuel was dropped off in um, Centrum So, then we took, um, we got in the plane and we're taken up to Centrum So. So there we are going up, crossing the ice. Everybody's very excited. All the glaciologists taking lots of photos. Um, and then this is Centrum So, and this is the landing strip, which is just this, this dirt peninsula um, by this delta that is in permafrost, so it's nice and hard so the plane can land on it. So this is the plane coming in. You can see our um, barrels of fuel stored up. And then everything comes out of the plane. Um, and by the time we've got everything out of the plane, the helicopter has flown up there. Um, and the helicopter is taking, so this is where we landed in Centrum So, and the helicopter is taking us to the Grotzdalen Valley. So as I said, when Gina and Robbie came up before, they had to go across the Centrum So by boat and then walk around, which is a 43 mile hike. And we were able to take a 10 minute helicopter ride straight over the top. So load up the helicopter and the helicopter could only take 300 kilos, including people. So there were lots of trips by the helicopter taking off and flying across. You can see he's got his, his gun there. Um, the, the polar bears will rip the doors off the helicopters, so they have to be just as careful as we are. And then we landed in the Grotzdalen Valley, again, looking up at that, that limestone cliff with the caves in it. Um, this is our food tent. So we had a tent in case the weather was bad, but there were some days it was, you know, the high might have been freezing, but when we got there, they were having one of the hottest uh, days in July they'd ever had. So it was, you know, it was, you know, maybe mid sixties when we got there, we had to be prepared for weather between minus 20 and plus and, and 80. And so, uh, so we were kind of prepared for that. And the food tent is a long, long way away from the, um, where we slept. Um, it's downward wind from where we slept next to water here make it easy um, and then the tents have to be put in a line because if the polar bear wanders into camp you don't want to have a circle and have him trapped um, and then this is um, Paul Gina's graduate student um, setting up the bear fence which we needed to have around when we camped you can see that that cliff of limestone above us so this is the bear fence. It is a series of rape alarms that are all connected together in a circle around the tents with string. And the idea is that if a bear wanders into the camp, the rape alarm gets pulled and then that gives us two or three seconds to know that there's a bear wandering in camp. Um, this is, I'm just gonna show this. The sound, I can't, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get the sound on work. So I'm not sure, is it gonna work? Oh, I got to turn that off to get it to work, I think. Um, you can do that. Here we go. So this is Gina. So I'm not sure if you can hear the sound, but that's her going through the, the bear fence there, triggering it off. Um, and then guns again. So we actually had to sleep with loaded uh, rifles in the tent because if a bear came in, you had to be able to jump up and, and deal with it. And these were high powered rifles with um, hollow tipped bullets. I'm not a gun person, but um, polar bear hair, because they need it to insulate is hollow. So you have this very thick hollow hair that surrounds them. And because of that, it's very difficult to penetrate. So you have to have these high powered rifle, rifles with hollow tipped bullets to actually penetrate through it. And there's 12 steps um, when dealing with bears, like number one being like, they don't even notice you're there. And the 12th step is, um, you know, you shoot the bear and you do it properly. And um, they really do not want you shooting bears. So there's all these other um, avoidance steps you have to take, but, you know, sometimes you don't have a lot of choice. And um, yeah, I didn't sleep with a gun in my tent. Um, but everybody else had a loaded gun in theirs. And one night Robbie got up to pee and tripped over the bear fence. And all you could hear him was like, stop, stop, stop. It's me, it's me, it's me. Because, you know, you get all these people that are jumping up with, with loaded guns. 
Um, and then Robbie is a pretty famous cave photographer, but if you know him well, he's also known for making shown thrones and shown thrones are these pit toilets that he likes to build. He builds them in caves and he builds them in campsites. Um, so this was the, it, you can see there was a huge rock up here that he trundled down to make the back of the shown throne. And he found some sandstone and that was on either side because the sandstone would warm up faster than the limestone. So you'd actually have a warm seat to sit on while you were sitting on the shown throne. And it even had a little table there. So you could sit on the shown throne and use it while you were having a, a beautiful view of the Grotzdalen Valley. And this is that cliff with all the, the caves in it. So we actually explored caves all the way from back over here, all the way around the front. Um, we accessed these ones at the back going up this valley and climbing up here. And then the ones at the front, we climbed up this. This was a really amazing pavement to climb up to get to the, the there is a contact between two different kinds of limestone and all the caves formed there. Getting up was trick, it's pretty hard work. You can see us coming up, how steep it was. And once you get up there, it's pretty cliffy. So we needed to, to do a lot of traverse lines to get around to entrances. Um, this is pretty, pretty exposed when we're up there. This is looking out of the Crystal Palace entrance. And again, you can see all this limestone. This is really old, really weathered limestone. So uh, not, not a lot of cave entrances left. It's all kind of weathered away. Looking from the entrance down at camp, so um, food tent is all the way around the corner here by the river. This was a tent that was set up for um, doing entomology, looking at insects up there. And this is where we were camped. And that's our helicopter and our pilot there. It was kind of cool. He'd fly up and wave at us, like just kind of hover outside the cave entrance and then take off. This is um, doing the science in the caves. This is Gina and her graduate student. They found some more flowstone. So this is the first cave that she, the, the cave she found the previous record in. And then we went there first um, to collect more samples. Um, and then this is why it's called Crystal Palace, um, going back there. This is hoarfrost. So there's actually, because the caves are in permafrost, so the, the rock is in permanently frozen water and the rock itself is very, very cold. The, the rock in this cave was minus nine degrees centigrade, which I'm going to try and remember what that would be. So it would be, I don't think it would be around 20, maybe 24 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So when moisture blows in, it just, the moisture just freezes against the rock and you get this hoarfrost. And these crystals here aren't that long. It's kind of hard to get an idea of scale. They're maybe two, three inches long, but we did see hoarfrost crystals that were over a foot long. It's really spectacular. This is me sitting outside. Um, I, I did, um, I mapped, I taught the graduate student how to map and the two of us mapped all the caves. It was really, really hard to calibrate the disto because the field lines here are dipping almost vertically into the ground because we're 82 degrees north. So for those of you that calibrate distos, I can always get my deltas down to 0.2 or 0.3 with no effort. And the first time I tried it, the delta was five. It was just a nightmare. It took ages to get these, these things. Um, I even I even used the satellite phone to text Derek. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And and it's like, it's probably the field line. So um, it was a pain getting them calibrated, but once they were, they were they were fairly accurate. And we were able to um, map these quick caves quite effectively. And it would, that ended up to be really, really valued to try, valuable to try and understand the airflow that we were seeing and also map some of the geology and microbiology that we saw. Um, oh, and I should say I had to keep coming out because it was so cold in these caves that the battery in the, the phone would get so cold it would lose its charge and I had to come out and charge it up um, with a little pocket um, uh, power bank just so I could survey these really quite short caves. There was some microbiology in this one. It looks like an old biofilm. Um, this is right at the contacts and I think there was some sulfur in there. So these are probably hydrogen sulfide streamers. This was getting up into Cairn Cave. Um, so Chris is a pretty good climber getting up there um, and uh, he would go up and rig the ropes for us to climb on up. And this one was called Cairn Cave because there is a big cairn in the entrance. And when we looked inside, the folks who published that article in the 60s um, had left um, a note in there with their names on. 
And the really interesting thing about these caves is at the back, they usually had these ice plugs. So you can kind of see it's clear up here and you could look into the ice plug, you know, 10, 12, sometimes 15 feet and see that the cave kept going. So we think what's happening is the permafrost, the frozen water is getting extruded out of the cave like toothpaste out of a tube, but you, it's encountering very dry, very cold air um, during the winter. And that's kind of lyophilizing. It's causing the surface to melt and evaporate. Um, so you have this kind of push and pull between the ice getting squished out and the, the air drying out from the cave side. So um, they always seem to be about the same distance back in the caves and it's probably heavily in influenced by, by climate. But I can imagine caves like this, I mean, they just have the look and feel of a cave that would probably go a couple of thousand feet, but you can only go 60 feet and then you hit this ice. They found uh, these are a novel speleothem that we found. I, I found them first in Crystal Palace and I looked at them and said, these look weird. And nobody had really noticed them. And I started looking and I found them in every other cave that we went to. And they seem to form right where water is condensing in the day. So it gets a little bit cooler at night um, and that ice would freeze, the water would freeze to ice and then condense again during the day. So we thought that maybe this was a precipitation caused by freezing water. So you get these um, condensate on the surface, which has no calcium carbonate in it. And it's very aggressive water. It would land on the surface of the, the, the host rock, the, the limestone, and cause dissolution. And then when it froze, um, that water crystal as was freezing would exclude the calcium carbonate and cause it to re-precipitate. And so you end up with these itty bitty tiny little spires. They're much, much narrower than a drop of water. So we know it's not a drop of water that's forming them. So they'd be about, I don't know, a centimeter long, one to two millimeters wide. I have an amazing graduate student who's able to get thin sections. And we were able to say that you see these laminations. And we don't know if these laminations are daily or seasonal laminations. But Gina did the isotopic analysis on them. And you actually get a signature if these things are formed by freezing water and that was a signature we got. So this was a, a new kind of speleothem that never been described before. So we called it cryogenic frost work, the stuff we see in wind cave. We did get some nice samples for um, dating. You see Chris here looking at one of the cores that they collected. Um, after we spent a week, 10 days in the Grotz Darlin Valley, um, the helicopter moved us to um, an area south of the lake and looking for caves on the way there. Um, and we went down here. This is Grotte de Quater, which is a cave that was discovered by the French um, earlier. I think it was the late 1950s, maybe 1956. So we had another camp here, Camp 2, near that cave. Um, on the way, we spotted this valley. And it was pretty impressive. And there's a lot of dissolution features in the valley. So we decided that at some point we'd, we'd come back with the helicopter. So we did a lot of ridge walking with the helicopter, which is definitely the way to ridge walk. Um, and we would come back and look at that. Um, the helicopter pilot was bored one day and actually went up and down that valley and found this entrance here um, and took a video with his cell phone and showed it to us. And we were very excited. So he brought us back. He was an amazing pilot because he would hover outside the entrance so we could look inside. And when we were looking at this one, we were right up against the entrance and it looked like his the blades of the helicopter were longer than the distance we had to the, the cave entrance, but we were fine. Anyway, he just plop it down here and we went and looked inside this cave. This is dropping the helicopter down. The height was all of 75 feet to get to the cave entrance. And it was a pretty spectacular cave. And this told us a lot about airflow. This was the longest cave that we discovered. It did not have an ice plug in it. Um, it was over 300 feet, ended up being the longest cave in Greenland. Um, and it had this big patch of frozen ice at the entrance that would freeze during the night and then thaw during the day. And it turns out that these are caused by airflow and um, uh, warmer, I guess I think it's warmer 
moist air coming out and freezing at the center the entrance as it comes out and hits the, the colder air but anyway you see these big patches of ice it's an indication that the cave goes more than about 20 feet um, so this is sampling the water in the entrance and then you get back to a certain point and you actually have you know in regular caves you might have a popcorn line where you have like a dissolution of above the level of the popcorn and then precipitation at the level of the popcorn and you have a convection loop with with warmer air flowing over the top of the colder drier air well we actually saw these loops created in the cave um, but they were actually being created during the winter when cold air was kind of sinking in and pushing warm air out and then in the summer it would um the, the cold the warm air would come in and get cooled by the rock and settle and then push air out from the bottom. So you have this cold air constantly getting pushed out and that would suck warm air in and you end up creating a convection loop, even though there's not a lot of cave because of the big temperature differences. So this cave had this really spectacular kind of condensation erosion line from the the warm moist air from outside and cold dry air and inside and this pump was driven by the temperature of this cave this is the cave, coldest cave that we measured we haven't found any records of any cave being colder so this one was minus 17 degrees centigrade which is one degree fahrenheit and we've looked at the literature from from russia and other places and no one's described any caves colder or as cold as this uh, we spoke to all the folks that have done extensive work in Russia and they're not aware of any caves. So Gina did never, didn't want to say this is the coldest cave in the world because she's like, well, we don't know, but it's probably the coldest cave in the world. Um, it's just a map and this is the cold spot down here right at the back, uh, which kind of powers all these, this airflow. And then we, um, when we were at the Grotto Botar, um, it was, eh, not particularly exciting there was a lot of features there that suggested that there was a lot of erosion activity and hydrology in the past but we really didn't find any caves other than the ones that the french found you can see that the, the uplift is pretty impressive here um grot de quartar because it had four entrances there's one here there's two up here and there's one here that's not actually connected, although it didn't like it was connected cave. This is the deepest cave in Greenland because you could actually go in here and pop out these upper entrances and see people waving up there. Pretty big cave, um, lots of interest in geology. Um, obviously, water flow had gone through this cave at one time, lots of um, features indicating water flow. Um, it was kind of a bust, this whole camp. We didn't find much caves. Um, we did a lot of ridge walking, didn't find anything else. We flew the helicopter around, didn't find anything. So um, Gina decided to cheer us up by cooking Austrian food. She's actually English, like me. Um, and she decided she'd, she'd make some Austrian food for a dessert for everybody. And this is her actual Austrian graduate student was not impressed with her effort in making um, Austrian food on that MSR stove. So we went from camp two and decided to set up a camp three near that big cave that we found um, and explore that valley to look for uh, additional caves. So we set up camp three, which is, um, uh, we called it the PRB Valley. Uh, it was named after Chris's dad who died during the expedition while we were up there. And that's where Kate's Cove, that big cave was. So another camp, um, <clears throat> This one, it was hard. We could have camped down by the river, but it would have meant that we wouldn't have been able to hear anything and we'd have been right by the noise of the water the whole time. So there was this little patch of ice up here that was melting and creating a tiny little stream. So we were able to kind of, you know, catch it in a basin that we built. And this is actually the bit out of a drill that we were using to take cores. It was a spare one. So we were able to put a little faucet out of that and collect water. And it just about lasted the last 10 days that we spent at this campsite. Uh, another shown throne. So we keep sitting on the shown throne. Um, and the view from this one's pretty spectacular. And you can see for a long way, you see where you start to encounter the, the ice and snow again off in the distance. 
Um, and then this is hiking up and down the valley looking for caves. I think we found 63 features in this valley, um, several caves, some with some flowstone in it, but nothing is as big as when we discovered Kate's Cove. Um, really challenging, lots of up and down, lots of exposure, getting up into the caves. Um, we spent a lot of time here and then um, we decided to take the helicopter and do some more ridge walking and we went north. So we went a couple of valleys over to see if it, there was anything. And we found this valley and we were um, flying up and down it and I spotted this entrance um, and we swung around, dropped um, the helicopter down and got inside. And this is pretty impressive. This is about a 30 foot entrance. Uh, and then I got into the side passage, which had amazing hoarfrost in it. And at the bottom, there was a passage that I could see through, but it was completely choked with debris. So I, I dug it open and it ended up being, I don't know, nine or 10 inches high when I got down there, which is plenty big enough. But for the, the, the non-cavers on the group, they, they found it pretty, pretty hairy. Um, and when I popped in on the other side, I saw this. And this is actually one of those ice bubbles again, getting extruded. But this one was perfectly clear and you could see back like 12 feet and it was like there was nothing there. It's like almost like you were looking at a soap bubble because you could see the edge of it, but it was so clear you could see into it. And at some point this ice had touched this rock, which was really cold and the rock had stuck to the ice. And as the ice moved, it picked up and carried the, the rock. And you can see that cold, dry air is starting to lie off light, starting to dry that ice. Um, and so at some point it's going to just drop that rock and there's Chris coming through that cool way. And then this is the view I saw popping up in that cool way. You can see the edge of the bubble there and you can see straight back into it. So really, really bizarre looking thing. One of the weirdest things I've ever encountered in a cave. Um, so that's where that bubble of ice was and the cool way. And then at the end of this big corridor in the entrance, there was another big ice plug. Um, more helicopter ridge walking. The helicopter dropped me and Paul off. It just kind of landed here. We jumped down and then the helicopter was gone and this is Paul watching it. Um, and we landed here because we saw this cave entrance, um, which ended up being a really nice cave, quite big. Um, we called it Swirly Cave, which me and Paul hated, but the, the pilot came in with us and he liked how the cave swirled around. So he called it Swirly Cave and he was the first person to spot it. So we let him name it. Um, and then further north again, so that valley is off in the distance here. We were flying around this ridge and we saw this entrance here and this entrance here. And we're more than 82 degrees north at this point. So these are the northernmost cave entrances in limestone in the world. Um, it turns out this actually went to a really nice cave. Um, you can't see it, but it has that ice plug in the entrance. And it went through the um, ridge to the other side. We couldn't physically connect, but they came very close to connecting on the survey. Um, that ice plug that's indicative that it's a, a nice big cave. Again, you've got that temperature, um, freezing moist air above and then the dry air below. Um, looking into it, it's hard to tell, but the, the hoarfrost in this cave was, was over a foot long. It's really, really impressive. Very hard to take photos of. Again, more features indicating that it was lots of water flowing through here. Okay, so science, what did we find in terms of science? So Gina got her samples. Um, she had planned on, think, on collecting something like 75 kilos of samples and she ended up with 150 kilos. So she wanted to bring them all back and hand carry them in luggage. So she actually asked us all to leave everything we could behind um, in Dalmuk's Haven so that she could put this on the plane to bring it home. So I, I didn't get my boots back for almost a year because I had to sacrifice the boot weight for the, the good of the, the sample collection. Um, this is some microbiology I did. This is where the caves were found was all at this contact between these two different kinds of limestone. This limestone here has a lot of organic material. It's quite shaly. So this can be a food, an energy source. And this level up here is rich in iron and sulfur. And so here, these big patches, I saw these big patches and on close inspection, they were these weird iron oxides. So I think what's happening is this is the food and this is the oxidant. And you're actually getting a lot of microbiology at the zone where these two meet. And that microbiology, especially this iron, 
um, reduction can make a very acidic environment is helping to carve out the caves. This was really weird. This is something that's called um, phyto, no, photocarin, not phytocarin, photocarin. So this is these little pillars, they're usually about two centimeters long and they all pour, point towards the entrance. And so the sunlight is coming in from over here and we believe these are made by photosynthetic bacteria. And the only other place I'd seen these, this is in Borneo, I took this photo in the entrance of a cave in Borneo. These are much longer, these spires are about five centimeters long, but they appear to be made by photosynthetic activity. So we think that whatever the conditions are in the tropics, for some reason get mimicked in these caves in Greenland. And I have some theories about condensating water and things like that, but, uh, I would love to get back and try to understand the microbiology of here and how it relates to this, because this could be really important in understanding photosynthesis on there. Um, found this, which is a photosynthetic algae. It's growing on a, um, a raptor pellet. So if you have a bird that consumes small mammals, it just eats the whole thing whole, whole and then it pukes back up the hair and the bones and you get this pellet. Well, there's not a lot of nutrients in these caves, but these pellets are rich in phosphorus and rich in nitrogen, which life needs to grow. So wherever we found these pellets in the cave, we found this green stuff and you can see it's actually sitting on ice. Um, this is a photograph, a microscopic image of that algae. And then this is the same image. I think it's the same image with a filter that um, shows photosynthetic pigment. So this is all photosynthetic pigment. And what's really crazy about this is this sample was in the dark zone of a cave that it was minus nine degrees centigrade and the theoretical limit for photosynthesis is seven. So we didn't have a biological sample. So this all had to be preserved. Um, so we didn't have anything living that we could study but I'd love to get back there, especially with somebody who's an expert in photosynthesis to try and figure out what is going on because this would change what our understanding is of photosynthetic mechanisms. And then for the cave records, we found the world's northerly most cave, uh, found the longest cave in Greenland, found the deepest cave in Greenland, and we appear to have found the world's coldest cave, minus 17.1 degrees centigrade. Um, and then flying back, is Gina with her samples there, very happy Gina. Um, and really all the thanks go to uh, Gina for putting this pretty wild and fun expedition and asked together and asking me to be part of it. And also the Greenland, Northeast Greenland case project. So thank you. Oh, that's, that's way too complicated. I don't know where that light switch is. Hazel, can you hear us again? Oh, but why can't I hear you? Because I was on mute, sorry. All right, there we go, excellent. Who has questions? Yeah, Peter's got a question for you. Is he, is he, is that far left, Peter? Yes. yes. Here, if you stand in front of the camera, you can have the mic. You can see and hear you. Hey, Hazel. Hey, Peter. Um, one, of your, one of your slides, you just showed your first cave map, and then you were showing the picture of a wall and talking about some microbiology. And on the wall, there were some pockets that looked like Toponi, which we see in caves in West Texas. Is that real or is it my office there? Describe, I've not heard that term before. Can you describe it? A bunch of brown pockets in bedrock that are a weird solution feature. Yeah, and is it the same kind of stuff you see sometimes in Kentucky? I don't know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking like Diamond Caverns, places like that. So I, I so that um, Oldensford formation that had the iron in it also has some sulfides, but they're, it's regional, it's quite, sporadic so there's regions where it's high and regions where it's not and i think that that cave was probably an area where there was a lot of sulfide which was powering a sulfitic system so you were getting biofilm so that's 
much more like a fossilized biofilm than what you're describing. I'm really familiar with what you're describing. And I see it a lot, but I also see it associated with caves. And I don't know if you'll find this in Texas because a lot of your caves are wet, but um, caves that tend to have gypsum deposits. And I think it's actually sulfuric acid that's forming just below the surface in those, whether it's because there's an oxygen gradient or not. But I think it might be a sulfur driven process that what you're talking about. Um, so I think it's super interesting, but like, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to Greenland. I'm going to go to Zeal, uh, you know, <laughs> no disrespect to Texas caves, but yeah. Yeah, it sounds different. The stuff I'm talking about is really, it's more like a cliff feature than an inside cave. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, what's the scale on those, Peter? There's a tiny, right? Or big? Uh, Can you put your finger in them? They're centimeters, and you get yeah. them in like honeycomb. Yeah, no, that's different. And that's in limestone? Yes. Okay, I'm thinking about the things that you see there, like, you know, imagine that you stuck a whole bunch of lentils against the rock and then it all fell out. That's what, that's the size of the scale of the things I'm talking about. Oh, thanks. Do we have any other questions? Questions. Uh, I think your talk was so cool. Yeah, so cool. I know. Just left yeah. people's <laughs> Did you have any? Uh, did you have any bio that was bigger than little microscope images? S smaller than a raptor, but bigger than a microbe. Uh, of what biology? Yeah, anything alive. Well, I have a picture of a fossilized rabbit, but not fossilized a, a dehydrated mummified rabbit, but. We saw one bird while we were up there, and it was so unusual to see something that was alive that we all kind of just stared at it without realizing we were all staring at it because it was just it was a bird and it landed on one of the tubs right in front of us. And we realized it's the first life we'd seen. And then we saw the musk ox, but there's nothing for them to eat up there. Right. So all around that area is ice. So they have to get around that. And then, you know, that that polar desert, there's there's hardly there's the whole place is just cryptobiotic soil there's very very few plants so there's nothing for them to eat there if they're getting there you know the must ox were there we're probably going right to the base of the glacier where you can have a lot more water and a bit more um, growth but all the action happens on the coast and you really don't want to be on the coast because that's where the polar bears are so no not not anything really you could see Fair enough. Well, on that note, I did appreciate that um, that you did talk about caves during your polar bear presentation. Um, oh, <laughs> I had I had no idea. Even in your your convention presentation, how big of a consideration the, the bears were. That's that's pretty intense, and you don't have to deal with that most other places. So yeah, yeah, it's um. No matter how terrified of bears you are in the U.S., you really don't have to to do that. But it was the the gun was right next to the toilet paper, so when you <laughs> grabbed the toilet paper to go to the bathroom, the gun was right there, and it's kind of like you didn't forget the gun. And it was we had the rifles, but we had these starter pistols that had these shells in them that were explosive shells, and we got training like how to use these things. And they were like, make sure you shoot the shell so it lands on the ground in front of the polar bear and not behind the polar bear because you don't want to scare the polar bear and make him run towards you so yeah good to know UT Grotto will take that to heart thank you <laughs> well why don't we give unless last 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 call for questions if anybody thought of a question while we were talking about questions if not why don't we give Hazel another round of applause and then <laughs> Thanks, everyone.